will keep our eyes on you so we can set our hearts on you lord we will set our hearts on you a mighty fortress is our god a sacred refuge is your name your kingdom is unshakable
how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my God and my King. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of, of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Church, you can be seated. Thank you.
Turn in the Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Now today is Education Sunday, and this is the day that we set aside at Grace Community Church to commence the academic year, to celebrate Christian education in all of its diverse manifestations, and to try to inform, equip, and inspire each of us as individuals, as families, as a body, as Grace Community Church, to start yet another academic year and to start it with a bang and to continue with this lifelong process of education, of the stewardship of our minds, of the process of bringing every thought captive to the lordship of Jesus Christ and to do all of this with enthusiasm and energy and knowing that all that we do in the realm of education is an important aspect of the Christian life. It is not the whole of the Christian life by any stretch, but it is important. Now one caveat to all this before we jump in. In the spirit of what Pastor Ted brought to us last week, and in the tradition of Grace Community Church, let's all be reminded that everything that we talk about at Grace Community Church with regards to education is underwritten by a spirit of grace. Not a single word from this pulpit today, or from that matter for any week, is from a perspective of condemnation. Wherever you are, wherever your family is, whatever your educational endeavors, your achievements wherever each member of your family is in his or her educational pilgrimage, whatever your particular situation may be, certainly we all have to recognize that though we all may have done a little or a lot, we all still have a long way to go. So wherever you are in your educational pilgrimage, we all need to recognize that 
whatever our starting point, we all still have plenty to do. There's no condemnation here, and Grace Community Church is here to assist you, to equip you, to give you advice, to help you, to cooperate with you, to come alongside of you, and to just basically to assist all of us in this worthy endeavor. So with that caveat, let's kick off another academic year. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and also the books, and above all the parchments. Let's pray. Lord, as always, we are truly grateful for your word. And speak to us today as we begin this academic year. Have us take away from today, from your word, from our thoughts and our reflections, all that you would have us to take away and inspire us and motivate us to yet again give this part of our life over to you as individuals, as families, and as our church. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, the author of 2 Timothy is, of course, Paul, and he is writing this letter, this epistle to Timothy, who was sort of his star pupil. Now, Paul refers to him as his beloved son at the beginning of 2 Timothy, and Paul knows in this passage that he is actually coming to the end of his earthly ministry, as he writes, and for that reason, he encourages Timothy, and he asks him to hold steadfast in his faith. So let's look at a famous passage that precedes today's main verse and gives it a little bit of context. So backing up, 2 Timothy 4, verses 5 through 8. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. A powerful passage, for sure. So much to comment on here. But for today's purposes, the important thing to note is that Paul is nearing the finish line. He's not bragging here. He's merely telling the truth. And by reminding Timothy that a crown of righteousness is laid up for Paul, he is encouraging Timothy to continue in his ministry. And then in verse 9, Paul begins to lay out some personal requests and instructions for Timothy. And what is the tone of verses 9 through 13? Well, if this wasn't Paul we were talking about, we would almost be inclined to feel sorry for him because the tone is one really of, of loneliness. He wants Timothy and Mark to come see him because only Luke remains with him. Demas has abandoned him, and Tychius has been sent to Ephesus. And then jumping down past verse 13 to verse 14 through 16, he again emphasizes how he has been abandoned, but even in the midst of all the hardship, the Lord has always delivered him. So that's the context. And with that context, let's look again at verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Now about the first part of this verse, we won't spend too much time, though of course we could. Just a few tidbits here. We know that Paul went to Troas. That's a region of what we would now call northwestern Turkey. And that's really, with regards to that particular trip, about all we know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul mentions his brief trip to Troas. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13. He says this, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went to Macedonia. So as was all too often the case in Paul's ministry, the fruit did not come easily. His stay at Troas was short. Things didn't go exactly as he planned. His spirit was not at rest, so he left. And apparently he left in such a way that he left his coat behind. So either he forgot it, or he didn't want to carry it, or maybe Carpus needed to borrow a coat. Whatever the circumstances, Paul left his cloak or Paul left Troas, and his cloak stayed behind. So you piece together 2 Corinthians 2 and 2 Timothy 4, and we could say this, Paul left Troas, went to Macedonia, and he left his coat there with Carpus. Now, sometime later in today's verse, he asked Timothy to bring that coat to him. And you're almost inclined to say, are you serious, Paul? You left your coat, and you're still trying to find a new one? Perhaps he was getting cold. He probably didn't have a spare. We could do a whole sermon on this one little revealing 
request here and about Paul and his character, but we covered a lot of that in Philippians. For today's purposes, we know simply that the Apostle Paul has given up everything for the sake of the gospel. He doesn't even have a coat anymore. He's approaching the end of his ministry. He requests Timothy to come see him and to bring him some things. And all of this is part of the context of this verse. Let's look again at verse 13. When you come, bring the books. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and also the books. I like this verse a lot. (laughs) All right, Paul is saying here in this passage, I'm at the end of my ministry, and the Lord will soon be giving to me a crown of righteousness. I've done a lot of traveling. I've preached and I've taught everywhere that the Lord has sent me. I've had some great victories, some major disappointments, but the Lord has always been good. Pretty soon I'm going to die. I'm going to go on to my crown of righteousness, and I don't even have my coat. So come see me soon, Timothy, and bring my books. Now let's be clear here. We can't absolutely, or with any absolute certainty, we can't say exactly what these books were. We know, of course, that they weren't bound books like we have because they didn't have bound books in that day. And, of course, obviously they didn't have Kindles either. So, but I still like personally to think of bound books when he says this here because that's what we have. And I like to think of Timothy, you know, arriving and pushing a wheelbarrow full of 200 pounds of books with a coat draped over the top. And I like to think of how happy that Paul would be to see Timothy and to get that big stack of books. We can know that the books that Paul was talking about here were probably written in Greek or Latin, and I think we can safely assume that Paul is talking here about something other than Scripture, something other than the Old Testament, something other than the Septuagint. We'll get to that point here soon enough. Though there's not a lot of commentary on this verse, those scholars who are willing to take a stand and to hazard a guess, they believe that Paul's talking here about writings other than Scripture or in addition to Scripture. But as he winds down his ministry, Paul still wants some books to read. Now let's look briefly at a little biblical evidence that shows us that Paul was, in fact, very well read and that he made good use of books in addition to the Old Testament Scripture. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Titus 1, 12, and Acts 17, 28. And we'll put all of these three up on the screen together. Now, the first two verses here are from Paul's own writings, and the third one is from Acts 17, and that is Paul. this is Paul speaking. Now, what is similar in each of these verses? They all contain direct quotes from third parties. They all contain direct quotes from other sources other than Paul speaking. He's quoting other material. And none of them are from Old Testament Scripture, which, of course, Paul uses extensively throughout his writings. Now, the first quote, bad company ruins good morals. That's a pretty good quote, by the way. But this is probably taken from a Greek comedy by Menander, who was a popular Athenian playwright, sort of in the, uh, the generation that follows the playwrights that you're familiar with, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides. The second quote, the one about Cretans all being liars, evil beasts, and lazy, gr- lazy gluttons, is from Epimenides. Now, incidentally, does anyone want to guess where Epimenides was from? He was from Crete. He was a Cretan kind of falls into the category of takes one to no one, I suppose. (laughs) The third quote, the first one from Paul's speech at the Areopagus in Athens, is also most likely from Epimenides of Crete, Epimenides the Cretan. So apparently Paul liked his Epimenides. And the final quote is from a Greek poem by the poet Aratus, and it's called Phenomena. It's a very known, well-known poem in Paul's day. As always, there's plenty of meaning in each of these verses, and we could analyze Paul's use of these sources in great depth if we had time. For today's today's purposes, it is sufficient to note that Paul made use, as he needed, of pagan literature. He was well-read, not just in theology and in scripture, but in other fields as well. Paul had, in fact, about as as good an education as he possibly could have in his day. Recall, first of all, from our study of Philippians, that Paul was, as he says in Philippians 3, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as unto the law, a Pharisee. So with regards to Paul's formal education, we know that it would have begun in Tarsus at the age of five. And Tarsus was, incidentally, an extremely cosmopolitan city in the day. And that most likely when he was 10 years old, he would have left Tarsus to live in Jerusalem and to begin his formal rabbinical training at the Hillel Rabbinical School in Jerusalem, which was a very prestigious and well-known institution in the day. We know from Acts 23 that Paul studied under the renowned rabbi Gamaliel, and historians know that Gamaliel in particular was fond 
of teaching his students of Judaism to borrow from Greek philosophy and literary sources, as we, can, as we have just seen. To, to make a long and fascinating story short, in terms of a formal education grounded both in Greek philosophy and in the Old Testament scripture, Paul had the very finest education that was available to anyone in his day. Now, of course, he obviously had to relearn much of what he learned in rabbinical school. And we know that to this end, that he also had some sort of direct revelation imparted to him during the time that he spent in preparation for his Christian ministry after his conversion. Let's look at Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So even though Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, as unto the law of Pharisee, with all of the education that that entailed, and even though his gospel was revealed to him by Christ himself, you might think that that would be enough learning to satisfy him for a lifetime. But even with all of that, what does Paul ask for Timothy? To bring him some books. So we've been put on notice, have we not? Even the Apostle Paul an apostle with an absolutely stellar education must read. Even the greatest, the most important theologian who has ever lived must read. Even a biblical author who was inspired by the Holy Spirit and who wrote so much of the New Testament must read. Even an apostle who was given a revelation not from flesh and blood, but from Jesus Christ must continue to read. Even someone who has done all that Paul has done and who is knowingly entering the final stages of his ministry, someone who is approaching eternity, still must read. So you think of it. By now, Paul has been preaching for at least 30 years, and yet he still wants some books. He had a wider experience and a broader education than most men, and yet he still wants some books. He has traveled throughout Europe and Asia Minor, and he has seen some of the finest prison cells in the Roman Empire, <laughs> yet he still wants some books. So what's the lesson here for us here? Pretty simple, right? If Paul felt the need to read, then we should also feel that need as well. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, it's typically incisive and unforgettable way as he was so capable of doing. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. <laughs> well then, that pretty well says it. We need to make use of the thoughts of others we need to read. Now, if you read Al Mohler's blog, and you should because he is the brilliant and articulate president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kentucky, and he is an articulate exponent of the Baptist Reformed theological views that Pastor Ted talked about last week, and on his blog, he routinely puts up his personal reading list on there, and he writes short reviews of what he's reading. His summer reading list is awesome. It is filled with recently published titles, history titles for the most part, History of the American Presidency, A History of the Feud of the Hatfields and McCoys, A History of American Innovation as Seen Through 15 American Automobiles, The Memoirs of a Career CIA Operative, A New Account of the Alamo, and so on and so on. So this is a man who reads widely and voraciously. If you follow John Piper, the great Reformed Baptist pastor and author in Minnesota, he says that he reads poetry every day. And if you Listen closely. If you consider his command of language, you can believe it. This man loves poetry. If you've ever followed R.C. Sproul, you know that he has read and thought long and hard about really every significant work of philosophy that has ever been written. If you consider the quality of his arguments, his use of logic, you can see that this man knows his philosophy. So in the tradition of Paul, each of these men can also say, bring the books. We need to read. Let's elaborate on this just a little bit with five points as to why reading is important. Now, these are not necessarily based on biblical authority. These are just things that occurred to me as an answer to the question, well, why should we bring the books? This is not exhaustive. Hopefully, you can add to this list with reasons of your own. So this is just a start. But as we begin this academic year, let's think about a few possible answers to the question. So why should we bring the books? First, we read because reading is essential to advancing Christ's kingdom. Let me give you just one small example of this. There's an excellent book that came out a few years ago called God's Secretaries, the Making of the King James Bible. And it tells the story of the 50 or so scholars from Oxford and Cambridge and London who labored for seven years to give us the King James 
Bible, the translation, which by any standard of measure is a monumental achievement. Let me just share with you one brief passage. The Church of England relied for its understanding of the often complex texts of Scripture on the ancient and inherited traditions of Christianity. The statements and resolutions of the Council of the Early Church and the great body of patristic scholarship, in particular those church fathers, above all Jerome, St. John Chrysostom, Augustine, and Origen, of whom 16, 16th century English scholars, including several of the translators, had made a particular study. Now this is, again, from a book about the formation of the King James Bible. So the point here being that the things that we enjoy in Christendom today, the things that we take for granted, the translations and the wide availability of Scripture, the commentaries, the linguistic tools, all the other reference works, all of these things, they require work, they require reading, they require extraordinary amounts of reading and study, and they are necessary for the advance of Christ's kingdom. The advance of the kingdom, of course, occurs in many ways, but much of the advance is done in silence through study, through the translation of Scripture, through commentary, through late hours and candlelight, or as in the case of Luther's translation, while he was on the run and in hiding as if he were merely a common criminal. So reading is essential to the advance of Christ's kingdom. Number two, we read because it is good for us. It is good for our personal development. It is important for what we do in the marketplace. And it is good for our health. On August 15th on the Harvard Business Review blog, there was an article called, For Those Who Want to Read, Sorry, For Those Who Want to Lead, Read. And it detailed how General David Petraeus, Steve Jobs, Nike founder Phil Knight, Winston Churchill, and many others were, were or are all avid readers. And not just readers of the topics that directly affected their vocational lives, but that they read very widely. And here are a few of the points that this article makes. Reading increases verbal intelligence, making you a more articulate communicator. Reading novels can increase your empathy, allowing you to work better with others, to understand others, and to increase what psychologists call emotional intelligence. All these are good skills to develop for our presence in the marketplace. And an active reading life can also improve your health. This article cites a study that argues that reading is the best way to relax and that even a short time reading can dramatically reduce your stress. Some studies even suggest that reading by keeping the mind active and engaged may also help fend off Alzheimer's. So there can be little doubt. Reading is good for you. A third point. Reading is essential to creativity, which is essential for innovation, which is essential to advancing civilization through building wealth. Ben Franklin said it this way, for the best return on your money, pour your purse into your head. And Ben Franklin was a very wealthy man, so he didn't just mean this in some sort of pious, metaphorical way. He meant it literally. If you invest in your brain power, you will actually have, if you do things right, you will actually have a financial return. Now, some of you, especially some of you young people, you're going to be called to work in business and technology. And in fact, the future of Grace Community Church depends on that fact that some of you are going to be called in this direction. Some of you will be called to work in developing ideas and turning them into practical solutions and in making them available in the marketplace. And if you're called to do that, then you need to be thinking creatively and imaginatively into the future and trying to see how the world where the world is headed, and what the world needs in terms of innovation and invention. Maybe some of you will work on creating the next wave of technological development, and we don't even know what that's going to be yet. Now, young people, though it is difficult for you to get your heads around this, try to comprehend that when your parents went to school way back in the previous century, way back in the 1900s, we didn't have an instant and unlimited access to basically all information. We didn't have the internet, let alone a powerful search engine like Google. This is all recent, and much of it has developed just in your lifetime, even though you can take it really for granted nowadays. Consider another innovation that has occurred in just the last six years or, six years or so, and that is the cost-efficient use of the process of using pressurized fluid to create fractures in a geological rock layer, which then allows petroleum and gas to pool which can then be easily captured. This is called hydraulic fracking in the oil and gas industry. And together with horizontal drilling, it has led to a real renaissance in the industry in South Texas, North Dakota, Colorado, and Pennsylvania. And all this has happened since 1997. And on the natural gas side, 
Natural gas is now so plentiful that the price has plummeted, and the problems of natural gas and using it effectively really have to do with its distribution and use throughout the United States rather than the supply. So here's the point. Someone out there, someone, perhaps some of you, perhaps a group of someones, is going to figure out how to get a large number of vehicles to use some form of very plentiful and evenly and well distributed natural gas as a fuel for our daily consumption in our automobiles. And the people that are going to do that are going to become spectacularly wealthy. And that's just one example. Across the vast spectrum of human activity, there are technologies waiting to be developed which will make life easier, more efficient, more comfortable, more healthy, less dangerous. And this process of innovation and creativity is at the heart of our economic system, and it is the true source of wealth. George Gilder, in an article just a few days ago in National Review, wrote this about innovation. It is dynamic, a force that pushes human enterprise down spirals of declining costs and greater abundance. The cost of capturing technology is mastery of the underlying science. The means of production of entrepreneurs are not land, labor, or capital, but minds and hearts. Enduring are only the contributions of mind and morality. All progress comes from the creative minority. Under capitalism, wealth is less a stock of goods than a flow of ideas, the defining characteristic of which is surprise. Creativity is the foundation of wealth. As a Princeton economist has put it, creativity always comes as a surprise to us. So again, what does he say here? To push human enterprise forward, we have to have creativity. Creativity is a product of what? Not land, labor, or capital, but mind and morality, heart and head. How do we develop mind and morality, heart and head? Well, one way is to read noble literature that elevates mind and morality, heart and head. He says that we have to master the underlying science. How do we do that? By reading science. He says that creativity and a spirit of surprise are related. How do we cultivate that? By reading fantasy literature, imaginative stories, and especially poetry. And later in the article, he mentions how doing the grunt work that others don't want to do, the perseverance that is required for innovation, is also critical. So how do we spur the virtue of persistence and just sheer doggedness? By reading biographies of those who have persevered. Now, according to a New York Times article back in 2007, Steve Jobs reportedly had, as it said, an inexhaustible interest in the books of William Blake, the visionary 18th century poet and artist. It was, by his own account, the vividness of Blake's creative visions in both his poetry and his art that spurred the creativity of Steve Jobs. And that creativity, coupled, coupled with the tenacity and attention to detail that he first learned as a student of calligraphy, that is at the heart of the first Mac computer. And the list could go on and on and on and on. Those who have propelled the American innovative free enterprise system forward have been avid readers of anything and everything. Third, to quote the always quotable C.S. Lewis, we read to know that we are not alone. We read to know that we're not alone. Now, isn't it interesting to note that in our passage today that Paul mentions both before and after verse 13, where he asks for the books, both before and after, he mentions being abandoned. Look again, verse 9, he asked Timothy to come visit him. Verse 10, he mentions that Demas and Crescens and Titus have all left him. Verse 12, he notes that Tychicus has been sent to Ephesus, and then he asks for his books. Then in verse 14, he comes back to this theme. He notes that Alexander the coppersmith has done him great harm. And in verse 16, he notes that he defended himself against Alexander alone. So in other words, Paul's request for his books comes in this section of the letter where the dominant theme is really one of loneliness, abandonment. So it seems that Paul, too, would agree with what Lewis says. Books help us to know that we are not alone. Now, to be sure, as Paul notes, it is the Lord who gives us strength, even in times of loneliness. And, of course, there is no substitute for Christian community, for actual flesh and blood contact, and that is, of course, why he asked Timothy to come see him. But even so... Books can help us to know that we're not the first to contend with despair or depression or loss. You're not the first to deal with family situations, with financial problems, with hurricanes, with plumbing problems, with car problems. And turning to books, whether it be a home repair manual to help us find practical solutions to whatever ails you, to poetry to help us express profoundly and deeply 
what we are feeling or to see the world in a new and surprising light, or biographies to draw inspiration from the lives of those who actually had it much worse than us, to books about how to homeschool, to books to help us with curriculum, to inspire us as educators, to books that help us with issues in our Christian walks. Whatever type of book you are talking about or turning to, books simply help us to know that we are not alone, but that there are solutions, comfort, and camaraderie at hand. And knowing that we are not alone can also be expressed in a very funny way. Now, we've all moved from one house to another, right, at some, at some time in life. You've moved, emptied one house, moved to another. We've all experienced the shock at how much stuff we've accumulated. And somewhere in that process of moving out the old stuff and going to the new place, we have all started to leave things behind as we leave our old house and move to the new one. Now, here's what Dave Barry said about that particular phenomenon. Another total breakdown of rational thought occurs when you start deciding to leave behind things as little gifts for the new owners. <laughs> you will look at your collection of 17,000 cans of various paints, none of which have been opened since the Protestant Reformation, <laughs> and each of which contains about a quarter inch of sludge hardened to the consistency of dental porcelain. <laughs> and you will say, the new owners will probably be able to use these. <laughs> You will say the same thing about the swing set gradually oxidizing into a major rust formation in the backyard, even though you know that the new owners are a childless couple in their 70s. <laughs> you will leave them your old eyeglasses, deceased radios, filthy rags, and baked goods supporting fourth generation mold colonies. You will leave them half-filled bags of lawn chemicals that have, over the decades, become bonded permanently to the garage floor. Near the end, you will not display the slightest shred of human decency. So you're not alone. <laughs> and by reading Dave Barry, you realize you're not alone. Fifth, reading creates points of contact with other people. Let me just share a few anecdotes with you. Now, many of you being homeschoolers are, what shall we say, casually familiar with the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. Well, in the summer of 1964, an English professor at Wheaton College named Clyde Kilby spent the summer with Tolkien to help Tolkien bring some order to the unwieldy backstory of Lord of the Rings. And that, we know that now, and it's called, what's it called? Cody? Anyone? Yeah, the Silmarillion. Great. Okay. During this time, Tolkien gave Clyde Kilby a copy of a book of fantasy short stories called The Book of Wonders. Let me read to you just the first sentence of the first story of the Book of Wonders. In the morning of his 250th year, Sheparok the centaur went to the golden coffer, wherein the treasure of the centaurs was, and taking from it the hoarded amulet that his father, Jishak, in the year of his prime, had hammered from mountain gold and set with opals, bartered from the gnomes. He put it upon his wrist and said no word, but walked from his mother's cavern. That's awesome. It makes you want to keep reading, right? And for years afterwards, Clyde Kilby treasured this book, and he talked about how important it was to get this book straight from Tolkien. Now, the fall of 1964, so this fall after Clyde Kilby was with Tolkien, a young man from Chattanooga, Tennessee, began studying literature at Wheaton College, and he received a degree a few years later, and he studied there in the Wheaton Literature Department, and he was profoundly influenced by Clyde Kilby, who had, of course, been profoundly influenced by Tolkien. Now, that young man went on to seminary and graduate school in Germany, and he became the great Reformed Baptist preacher and author that we know today as John Piper. And if you listen to enough Piper sermons and you read enough of his books, you will know that he credits often Clyde Kilby as being a profound influence on him, and especially with helping him to learn to love poetry. The point being, the love of these books, the reading of them, the writing of them, the teaching of them, the discussing of them, the giving of them as gifts, it was the books that created ways for Tolkien, Clyde Kilby, John Piper to interact and to influence each other, to spur each other on. While we're mentioning Tolkien, let's not forget that it was Tolkien, the very non-evangelistic, very traditional Roman Catholic who had countless hours of conversation with the young atheist C.S. Lewis, with whom he shared common literary interests. They read the same books. And I was reading just yesterday a letter that Tolkien wrote to Kilby where he said that were it not for Lewis's encouragement, he never would have even attempted to publish Lord of the Rings. Lewis, as we know, went on to become a Christian, 
certainly some of the influence there had to be the many hours of conversation that he had with Tolkien. As a Christian, of course, he went on to write many important and influential books. Among the most important has to be mere Christianity. And countless Christians will tell you just how much mere Christianity has influenced them. And no one was more vocal about this than Chuck Colson. Colson, of course, was the founder of Prison Fellowship, and countless men and women have heard and received the gospel in prison because of the ministry of Chuck Colson. So if you think about it, there's a direct spiritual family tree, as it were, between Tolkien and Lewis and Colson and to many Christians that we don't even know their names of that are still in prison today, but they are all linked together. And the books, the books that Tolkien and Lewis discussed, the books that they wrote, the books that Chuck Colson read, the, these books are part of the glue that hold all of these relationships together. The books that Tolkien wrote and that Clyde Kilby assisted with and read, the books that Clyde Kilby taught to John Piper, the books and the poetry that Piper has written, the sermons that, he's, that he has preached that benefit us, all of this is related. So you see the books, the reading of them, writing them, discussing them, giving them, receiving them as gifts. These books are points of contact that help us to connect with other people and to build up relationships. They help to, in this way, spread the gospel. They encourage us. They inspire us. They help create community. They help build relationships. And they might even impact eternity. So that's just a couple of reasons to read. Now, hopefully you have thought of plenty more on your own. So bring the books. Read. Read everything that you can get your hands on. Develop your own interests and your specialties, but push yourself to read outside of your own natural interests as well. As Paul says, bring the books. Expand your mind. Solve problems. Take solace and comfort. Laugh out loud. Think deeply about the things of God. Let's continue. We'll look at the last part of verse 13 now. When you come, bring the books and above all, the parchments. Now, other translations might say, above all, the scrolls, or especially the scrolls. And now, just as with the books, we cannot dogmatically here say with certainty just what the parchments were. But we're going to make a defensible interpretation here. As most commentators who were willing to take a stand, the general view is that the parchments that Paul refers to, the writings that he especially wanted, see, he wanted the books, but above all, or especially, he wanted the parchments that they were scripture. And of course, for Paul, that would mean the Old Testament scripture, right? Now, interestingly, some scholars have also speculated that maybe Paul is referring to his own writings here. It's an interesting thought. From our perspective, the net result is simply unchanged because, of course, Paul's writings are, most of them, many of them are for us scripture. So when he says, especially the par parchments, it is fine, it is right for us to hear especially the Bible. This interpretation is defensible, as what could be more clear from the life of Paul than that he, yes, that he loved the books, but above all else, he especially loved Scripture, and he loved the gospel. He loved God's words. Bring the books, by all means. Bring the non-biblical books, the pagan literature, but above all else, bring the Scripture, the books of the Bible, the Word of God. And that is exactly how our reading and our education should proceed. Bring the books, absolutely. Study, read, spend time on everything. Because of the the technological innovations that we've just been talking about, this point is today even more ironic than it has ever been. Because, think about it, the Bible is more available than it has ever been in the course of history. Yet, it seems that the number of people that actually read the Bible grows smaller every day. And the reality is that none of us has yet felt what we need to feel about the Bible. None of us. Not yet. But we can ask God for his grace to help us to love the Bible more. Even with our own shortcomings, let's consider the Bible. So what can we say about the Bible just generally? Well, with the Bible, God brought into being over a long period of time through many diverse human agents his self-authenticating revelation to man of who he is and who man is and the truth of man's relationship to God, to himself, and to other people, and in fact, to all of creation. And in the Bible, God has set forth for us in his gospel just exactly how he is accomplishing the reconciliation of God and man in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and who was and is yet to come, the eternal word, 
the second person of the Trinity and the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Those whose eyes are open to the truth set forth in Scripture begin to see and to hear these truths, and then they are called both to life eternal and life abundant. Now, you may not yet see all that you would like to see from the Bible. So we need to ask for open eyes, open ears, and open hearts. We need the Bible to shout out loud to us, to speak to us loudly and clearly of the things of God. So again, back to 2 Timothy 4. Well, we can't say with absolute certainty that when Paul says bring the parchments that he means Scripture. I think, personally, I think that is what it means. And I think that is defensible. He possibly could have meant something else. So admittedly, we're using a little bit of freedom here, a little bit of creativity, a little license, and using this verse as a jumping off point to a larger discussion. But let's take a moment and look at a passage from Paul that leaves us with no wiggle room where no creativity or freedom is necessary because he speaks here with complete clarity. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but it's what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. So a few observations from this potent text. First, God has spoken His Word. And what does Paul say? When you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us and accepted it, not as the Word of men, but as it really is, the Word of God. So Paul calls the message that he brought to the Thessalonians the Word of God. He says it twice, and he distinguishes the Word of God from the Word of, word of man. Again, you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. Now, the human element here is, of course, necessary, but it's also subordinate. The word of God went forth from Paul to the Thessalonians. But still, it was not Paul's words. It is the word of God. And when we read what Paul wrote today, those writings that are in the canon, Paul, obviously, of course, Paul did the writing. But all that he wrote, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, and so on. It's the Word of God. And that goes from everything from Genesis to Revelation as well. Now, recall the passage from Galatians 1 that we looked at earlier. What did Paul say? That the gospel that he preached is not man's gospel, but it was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. The same is true for the full canon of Scripture that we have today. The Word of God goes forth in human language, originally, of course, in Hebrew and Greek. And for us, for the most part, in English translation. But still, even though there are many layers of human agency here that is involved in the Bible itself and in the proclamation of the Bible, still the Bible remains the Word of God. That leads to the second point from this text. So first, God has spoken. Second, He has used human words. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Now, the Bible is the same for us. It is God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it comes to us in words, in language that we can understand. And then the Holy Spirit illuminates God's Word in us. The Holy Spirit makes us spiritual such that we are able to receive spiritual truths. This is incredible if you just step back and ponder it for just a moment. So God gave us language, language which allows us to communicate both verbally and in writing. And God, in fact, also spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light. The word also became flesh and dwelt among us. So language is, to say the least, important. And obviously this is something that plants and animals don't have. And then God, in his grace and mercy, he gave us a book written in human language that contains all that we need to know about him and how to live. He gave us a book in human language which leads us to life abundant and life eternal. That leads to the third point. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us. So God has spoken. He's used human words. And third, we receive the word of God. So we do have to hear. We have to comprehend. We have to understand the word of God. We have to understand the meaning of the words of God, just like we have to understand the words on the page of any other text or in any other conversation. To understand the word of God at a minimum, obviously we have to be conversant in language with an adequate vocabulary. To read it, we have to be literate. But we can continue. And this flows back into the first part 
of this sermon. We have to understand God's word as much as we possibly can. The Bible contains every literary form and every literary device, as you would expect from such a profound work written over such a long period of time by so many authors. So seeing as the Bible contains poetry, doesn't it serve us well to know something about poetry? Since the Bible contains history, doesn't it serve us well to know something about history, including the history that is not spelled out in Scripture, but which we can access through books? So you see the books and the parchments are all related here. Since the Bible contains theology, doesn't it serve us well to know something about critical thinking and so on? That leads to the fourth point. Anyone who's literate can read the Bible and can understand the words on the page. Anyone can open up the history that is in the Bible and read it. Anyone can analyze the poetry of the Psalms and elsewhere in the Bible. You just have to do the work. And we too as believers, we should work at this. But as we work at this from time to time, we will encounter non-believers who talk about the Bible, who know the languages, and who actually know something about the content. But not everyone accepts the Bible as the word of God. Rather, they treat it as the word of man, exactly what Paul is talking about. And that brings us to point number four. So again, first, God has spoken. He's used human words. We receive the word of God. And fourth, we must accept it as authoritative and true. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God. We must accept the word of God. We must, as Paul says, see it for what it is, and that is not the word of man. And that is the difference between saving faith and mere intellectual interest in the message or the books or the characters of the Bible. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Which is to say, God opens our hearts. God opens our eyes. He causes us to be enlightened. He causes us to hear and to accept. He causes us to embrace the message of the Bible. He causes us to have saving faith, to have a faith that not merely ponders God's word from a safe distance and sort of remains aloof and says, that's interesting, the the things that those people did or thought back then. No. When God acts in the heart of his people, he causes us to say, yes, I believe that. I agree with that. He causes us to take hold of the Bible, to love it, to seek to know more of it, to embrace it, to hang on to it. He causes us to be desperate without it. He doesn't cause the Bible to be easy for us, nor does he automatically cause our lives to conform completely to what the Bible teaches, obviously, right? But he does cause us to say, yes, I believe that. I want my life to reflect that, or at least... I want to want my life to reflect that. And without him causing us to accept his word, it will forever remain to us at best an interesting relic, a curious historical document. And at worst, we'll be just utterly uninterested in it. Now, many of you have testimonies in this regard about how you were at one stage in your life completely indifferent to the Bible. And then as God began to work on you, all of a sudden you found that what? That you hated the Bible. And then God overcame your resistance, and now you love it, and especially you were in love with it, especially those first few months after your conversion, and then at that point you couldn't get enough of it. You need to continue these testimonies. You need to keep telling that story, reminding yourself and reminding us of how that has worked in your life. Let's continue with the fifth point from 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. We received the word of God, accepted it truthfully, and then with us, just as with the Thessalonians, it goes to work. God has spoken in human words. We have received it and accepted it, and after that, and because of all that, it goes to work in us and on us. Of course, it cannot be otherwise. If the word of God is what it says it is, then it is going to go to work on us. Remember Hebrews 4, verse 12? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like when the Word of God goes to work. This is what it looks like and feels like when we are convicted by Scripture, when we read it, when we hear it, when we hear it rightly divided, when we realize that the Bible does, in fact, discern our thoughts and our intentions. Have you been there? 
And if you are a believer, of course you have. And the more you grow in your faith, the more we grow, the more we seek out and welcome this piercing to the division of soul and of spirit. And the more that the word cuts us and shaves us and pierces us and slices and dices us, the more we realize that, wow, though that is painful, that is still good. Have you been there? Have you felt the sting of God's word followed by the balm of his grace and mercy? Can you say that every time that once you make it through, then of course, it is worth it. And I came across a quote this week from a novel called Free Fall by William Golding. Many of you know William Golding as the author of um, Lord of the Flies. And in this book, the headmaster of a school tells a gifted young artist the following. If you want something... You can always get it, provided you are willing to make the appropriate sacrifice, something, anything. But what you get is never quite what you thought, and sooner or later the sacrifice is always regretted. Wow. A very dreary, blunt, and despairing way to look at the world. Don't try too hard, because you might actually get what you're going for, and you're not going to like it. Not exactly the American dream, right? But it is also undeniable that many people who have sold their soul and given up everything for some particular object, they would agree with that, right? And what a terrible moment that must be to realize, I gave up everything for this, and I chose poorly. And though that thought is sobering and brutally realistic, in many ways, that is life for unbelievers. Now, contrast that with Christian sanctification. Contrast that with your experience with the double-edged sword of God's word as it goes to work on you because you have accepted it as the word of God and not the word of man. Contrast that with the fact that when you hear God's word and accept it and it goes to work on you as Paul says that it did with the Thessalonians, is it not the case that you can say, yes, that was painful, but it was worth it. The word of God required a serious change in my life, in my priorities, in my thoughts, in my words, in my deeds. The word of God required me to apologize. It required me to forgive. It required me to speak up, or perhaps to bite my tongue, but it was all worth it. Not that it was easy, but that it was worth it. And that is what it is like when God's word is at work in us. And that bleak quote from William Golding's novel reminds me of yet another quote that is even more grim from Bertrand Russell. He said this as he approached his death, There is darkness without, and when I die there will be darkness without within. There is no splendor, no vastness anywhere, only triviality for a moment, and then nothing. That's what Bertrand Russell says. What does Paul say? The time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So when the word of God is at work in us, we see the world radically different. We see the world in a true way. We see the world entirely different than those who have rejected the word of God. Now with that, let's circle back to the beginning of this verse because we passed right over this. But now hopefully we are in a much better position to take notice. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of man, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Again, God causes us to accept his word, and when it goes to work, it is right to give him thanks. And are we thankful enough for God for working in us through his word? Are we thankful enough that he has given us his word at all? He is not obligated to do so, but still he has done so. Are we thankful for that? Are we thankful, parents, when our children begin to accept the word of God themselves and when it goes to work in their lives? Children, are you thankful that your parents accept the word of God and they try to live their lives accordingly? Are we thankful for those who have throughout our lives rightly divided the word of God and imparted it into our lives? Are we thankful when a life is spared for eternity by God's word, when relationships are healed by God's word, when his church is strengthened by God's word, when we the sheep are fed by God's word? Are we thankful? Are we thankful enough? Do we thank God constantly, as Paul said? 
And we have, we have plenty of room for growth here, do we not? Clearly, we have plenty of room to grow in our esteem of God's word. So while, yes, that is a challenge, it is also an opportunity because we know exactly what we need to do. It seems that the key to the Christian life, the key to being a follower of Jesus Christ, is something like this. Now, see if you agree. It is taking the Bible, the Word of God, with the gospel at its core, with everything that it says about Jesus Christ, including that he lives today, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, yet he is also with us, taking all the Word of God, rejecting nothing, but accepting everything in the Bible, and then consuming it, both individually and collectively, together in this community of faith, so that the Word of God is at work in us, producing a new way of life constantly, triumphing continually over the old ways, producing the fruit of the Spirit to the glory of God. Does that sound about right? Let's bring all of this home. So where does this leave us today on Education Sunday? The call to educate and be educated and to abide in God's Word, these are no small matters. The temptation to indifference or just plain exhaustion is great in the weakness of the flesh. The temptation not to finish the race is always there. So what are we to do? Well, let's bring together today and last week. Let's remember, none of us are on this journey alone. None of us are alone in the calling upon our lives of pursuing Christian education, of the renewing of our minds, of the lifelong call to train our minds, and the call on us to cling to the Scripture, to know it, to savor it, to love it, to accept it for what it is, not the Word of man, but the Word of God. We are a church. We're in this together. We are all here together to inspire, challenge, and support, to assist and equip, to collaborate and cooperate, to encourage, to edify, and build up. Let's try to bring this home by looking at another passage from Paul where he talks about the nature of the church. Let's look at Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place, place for God by the Spirit. Now just look at all the ways that Paul says that we are in this together. Built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, by the way. Built on the foundation of Scripture. So he compares, Paul compares the church to a household and every converted sinner, every follower of Jesus Christ, everyone who accepts the word of God for what it is, is one of the family, one of the household, a fellow citizen, a servant, and a child in God's house. The church is also compared to a building, and Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Now within this structure, within this household, we are united, we are being joined together, and the church is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And for us here today, the church is, of course, most clearly manifest and most appropriately manifest as Grace Community Church of Magnolia, Texas. Now, with regards to bringing the books to this general educational endeavor that we have talked about, simply recognize that at Grace Community Church, we are a little bit freakish about this topic. We are collectively, you are collectively, a body which is very highly motivated in this regard as a group of amateur and professional educators, and most of us are at least part-time educators. Some of you are full-time educators, but just to put some nuts and bolts on all of this, whatever educational goal you have as a teacher or as a student, whatever field of knowledge you want to look into, whatever type of program you're interested in, we can help you. Someone here at Grace Community Church can help you from kindergarten through a PhD or for any finite topic. We are collectively aware of most of the opportunities and resources that are available either here locally or out there in the world. We can point you in the right direction on some things, and on other things we can actually help you achieve your goals here in-house in good old Grace Community Church. So don't be shy. Ask around, ask questions, let one of the elders know what you're interested in and pursuing or thinking about or learning, and we can and we will help gladly. We will help you gladly to bring the books. And I think by any standard of measure when it comes to bringing the books, we are doing, at Grace Community Church, we're doing enough. We simply need to continue with what we're doing. Now, with regards to the parchments, especially the parchments, that is, with regards to the Bible, we are also deeply committed. 
But let's be honest, when it comes to the Bible, we're not doing enough for the simple reason that we will never have done enough. We will never love the Bible too much. We will never know it too well. We will never cling to it too readily. But by God's grace, together as fellow citizens and members of the same household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the cornerstone, we can move forward. We can aspire to grow our household, our church, into a holy temple in the Lord. If we collectively or individually and as families, if we press forward in God's words, then we can become all of the things that we heard about last week. We can become a place of grace, of community, of sanctification, of treasure, of salvation. We can exhibit more humility, more kindness, more courage, more service, more joy, more perseverance, more helpfulness, more empathy, more faith, love, and hope. We can become more like a holy temple in the Lord with Jesus Christ as the cornerstones. So bring the books, but especially bring the parchments. And may the Lord stir up in us this academic year a love for the books, but above all, maybe he, may he ignite in us a massive bonfire for his word, the Bible. Amen. You may pray with your families and serve the Lord's Supper. And then Pastor Ted is going to come and lead us in a time of prayer for our academic year rather than um, the, de- not the doxology.
like the grass The grass withers and fades away All flesh is like the grass The grass withers and fades away The glory of man like a flower that shrivels in the sun and falls the glory of man like a flower that shrivels in the sun and falls but the word of the Lord The grass, the grass withers and fades away. All flesh is like the grass, the grass withers and fades away. The glory of man, like a flower that shrivels in the sun and falls the glory of man like a flower that shrivels in the sun and falls but the word of the Lord endures for Three groups of people here today, and uh, I want to ask our elders to help us with this. Um, if you are taking classes in the college level somewhere, if you would make your way right there by Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, if you'd stand up, if you'll just come to him and Pastor Dan and Pastor Mark Cole, if you would go and put your hands around them, representing our church, just all our college students, any student here that's taking a class. Also, if we have adults that are continuing in education and you're taking a class, working on a master's degree or a doctoral degree, um, we'd like for you to come forward as well, uh, any other uh, classes that you're taking. <laughs> and we're hoping those doctoral degree students are finished soon. <laughs> All right, if you would, uh, college students, if you would gather tightly together and allow our elders to place their hands on your shoulders and just love on you. Let's pray, church family, if you'll pray for them as I'm leading in this prayer. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for these students, Lord, that you have called and you have provided for to this next season of life and this next step in their education, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, for the many sacrifices that are being made by their parents and by their families, Lord, and the provisions, Lord, that you're providing for them. Lord, we know that they're grateful and that they are ready to take on this next season of life. And whether it be just traveling from their home uh, to a college campus or to take classes somewhere nearby or, or whether they're going off and living on their own for a season, Lord, we know your hand of protection is over them, and we pray, Lord, you'll continue to watch over them and that you will provide for their daily needs. And, Lord, you will provide for all that, um, that they need, Lord, to be the best student they possibly can be and that you are preparing them, Lord, for the next season of life. And we pray, Lord, for the proper attention and attitude toward their studies. And, Lord, may they continue to develop uh, as someone who is bringing glory and honor to you. And, Lord, we pray and selfishly as well that you will grow them spiritually, but, Lord, that they will be light on their campuses or wherever they're taking classes, Lord, that the, the light of the Lord will be very evident in all they say and do. And, Lord, may all the faith and all the teachings that they have learned here today, as Pastor Mark brought forth today, that the Word of God will come forth in their life as they go out and represent you well out in the marketplace and on campuses, Lord, throughout our community and our state and our country, for that matter. So we pray for protection over our college students, Lord. Bless them. Bless all those who are pursuing higher education. Lord, we thank you again for the dedication they have and for all the support family members they have, Lord, making this possible. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, students, college students. This next group of students, if you are um, home, being homeschooled or you're taking classes here, if you would again join uh, the pastors in the middle of the floor there. All our, all our children, um, probably pre-K through or three-year-old through high school senior, um, anyone that's con continuing their education at home, Most of our students are being directed by their parents. They have parent-directed education. Uh, some are using other outside sources as well, and there's a variety of educational means and methods. But the prayer is uh, going to be for you this, this year to have a, a great educational year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these students that stand before us and how we have got to have been able to watch them, Lord, grow and mature here in our church and our body and our community of faith, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for allowing us that privilege of seeing them mature right before our very eyes. And, Lord, we've watched so many of them run through this cafeteria screaming and hollering. And, Lord, then we've watched them grow and mature and become godly young men and women, Lord, that will represent you well. And we thank you, Lord, for that privilege we have as a church to watch them. But, Lord, specifically, we're praying for a discipline of mind and thought and body. Lord, we're praying for attitude for this year, Lord. We're praying for steadfastness. Lord, we're continuing to pray for a yearning for learning, that these students, Lord, will see their education as their education and not their parents, Lord, uh, that they will not have to be prompted or pushed or prodded, but that they will pursue the, the learning, Lord, you uh, place before them. And as we take this message that we've heard today to heart, we pray that these students, Lord, will be protected and that they will be protected from any attitude, Lord, that would distract from their year. We pray that they'll be protected from any incident, Lord, that will hurt them or harm them. Lord, we pray, Lord, that their hearts will be open and, and they will find, Lord, the, the path that you have for them and the career and the future, Lord. We know they're all preparing to be godly men and godly women who will represent you and raise families, Lord that believe in you and trust you and serve you, Lord. But we also know you call them to special interests and skills. And you, Lord, may, you, uh, may they see what that is this year. May that come forth. And they begin to get an idea, a picture of what their future life will look like, Lord. And we're praying, Lord, they will prepare, be preparing for their future family, their future uh, spouse as well. Lord, what a great season it is for us to participate in their education. And I thank you, Lord, for uh, all they're going to accomplish this year. We give them to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, students, if you'll make your way back to your seat, and then our last group that we close with will be our parents. So parents, if you would make your way into the middle aisle. And this is our closing prayer. So after parents are located there, children, we're going to ask you to move toward them. Let mom and dad go first. All other adults. All right, squeeze in mom and dad, and now children, if you will stand up and walk toward them. 
and place your hands on the, the nearest mom or dad. Let us pray. Father God, in the center of this room are a very special group of adults, Lord. You have worked in their individual lives, Lord. You have developed them, and Lord, you have called them. You brought them together as a special bond, as a couple. You have blessed them with a marriage, and now, Lord, you've blessed them with the opportunity to lead forth and prepare another generation of believers and educators, movers and shakers. Lord, we know that you have uh, provided for their needs throughout their life as a couple and as a family. And now, Lord, we pray for these adults, these parents, Lord, as they're directing the education of their children, they're taking on that biblical role of spiritual discipleship and academic discipleship, Lord. We thank you again for the dedication that they have and for the conviction, Lord, and the commitment. And, Lord, I'm praying today for joy, for joy and contentment in the journey that they're on with their children. Lord, we thank you for allowing them to see this as a privilege, Lord, of directing the education of each of their children. What a, what a blessing, Lord, to see the way that they have, uh, they have taken hold of that call, Lord. They've embraced it, Lord, and that they have leaned on friends and other adults in that circle that they're shoulder to shoulder with, Lord. And as Pastor Cole said, yes, we're, we're all together as a community of faith and a community of educators, and they're not any greater than those in the center of our circle today. And we thank you, Lord, for the joy they can have in that. And Lord, I'm praying also to finish strong, that so many, Lord, have been so faithful to education through the years of their children, and now even coming toward the end of uh, their, their children as they're getting older, Lord, we pray that each family will finish strong. Some will start strong, some will continue strong, and my prayer is that we will all finish strong. So as we begin this year, the celebration of education, Lord, on this day, we thank you again for the opportunity to be led by godly men and women at Grace Community Church in our ministry and our endeavors, but also, Lord, in the education that's occurring within the homes. Bless this year. Lord, we give it to you. In Christ's name we pray. And God's people said, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Deacons, a final word. Deacons, if you'll meet on the stage. Deacons on the stage, we appreciate that. You're dismissed.